understanding integrative cognition as a research idea or a research theme. One of the things as an undergraduate, if you have an idea of something you would like to research, you're not necessarily given a guidebook on how to go about getting in contact with professors who would be uh, interested in advising or carrying out some research. So sourcing potential professors is its own beast, as it were. And I've been studying for my analysis of behavior final, and that will be helpful for me to get an A on that final, as um, I was very loaded up this semester and missed some of the uh, pop quizzes, which account for about 30% of the grade. So I'm taking to heart and studying up for the final to make sure I get an A. And of course, since it is an analysis of behavior course, the professor has very cleverly arranged these behavioral contingencies. I do not um, care so much about the grade as I do whether or not I'm learning meaningful information. And that is consistent with what I would like to study in, in regards to fixed versus growth mindset and to my own education, I try and apply that same thinking. But this idea of integrative cognition. So towards the end of this book here, uh, written by Dr. Madden, who it's a very, he's done a very good job with this book, in my opinion. So one of the things that I have tried to tackle, or one of the things that I have considered over the last few years is the evolution of complex consciousness in humans and the way that that is correlational to the evol or the selection of empathy. Um, it seems to me that there is a clear distinction between selfishness and empathy, or we can find examples where there are altruistic examples within human behaviors that go above and beyond what we would expect under normal, let's say, other species conditions. We can understand to some degree that the whales should care about whales and maybe even some dolphins, but we don't necessarily see other species organizing large-scale preservation uh, efforts in the way that we see humans do. And so this idea here is that when you select for complex empathy, you are selecting the same neurocognitive pathways that can facilitate um, complex consciousness, complex awareness. Now, obviously, there are cases when with sociopathy where we see high degree of situational awareness and a low degree of empathetic connection. Um, but the, the core infrastructure is correlated. And Obviously, it's very complex, but in the course of this consideration, one of the ways I've approached the brain or thinking about the brain is this idea of integrative cognition. So let me see if I can pull up my uh, portfolio page that I have been putting together to try and give a sense uh, for universities or programs to maybe get a little bit of a sense of what it is that I'm studying. So I use this example here, or this picture analogy of a brain, and we see these two different hemispheres, and one is communicating this idea of, you know, an academic or educational pursuit, and then the right side is a bit more creative. And these are facets of cognition, you could say. For the sake of ex example, it is easy to give an analogy of left brain, right brain. And the left brain, we see a way of structuring things. And the right brain, we see a way of connecting things. So what this, in terms of considering the selection of consciousness, in a sense, we see the selection of two different brains operating simultaneously, or two different hemispheres. And one hemisphere focuses on how things are, are different or distinct. And that is an ability to differentiate. And the other hemisphere, we could say, is focused on seeing how things are connected or related. And that's a way to integrate. And I use this analogy in terms of calculus, that the brain, if uh, survival is the process of species engaging in a, in a form of calculus, 
or you could say metacalculus. And this is sort of approaching this idea that when we teach mathematics, for example, we're often teaching from a a bottom-up approach instead of a top-down approach, that we often try to just do a high-definition rendering one frame at a time, somewhat disconnected from an overall picture. And I think that the part of the issue with that is you're going to be selecting for a specific type of thinker, and you're going to select for thinkers who can do do that and excel in that, but you are narrowing your selection range, and it may in some ways not be reflective of the same type of cognition that that generated calculus. In other words, understanding the top-down approach that Newton and I can't remember the exact name, but it's something with an L. Leibniz. Yeah. So here's our Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz. Probably butchering the German there, but the idea is that he is credited as a co. Uh, creator, as it were, of calculus, but that's still not really an accurate term because we're we're describing the realization, not the invention of something. But the idea here is that we have th- these two facets of cognition, and one enables us to perceive the relatedness of things, and, and another facet enables us to perceive the distinction of things. And we see this theme, this fractal patterning play out in things like identity conception, where you, a person perceives themselves as a distinct individual. In other words, they differentiate their own identity relative to a group, and the group is more collective. And so we see that exchange of the hemispheric exchange. And so what's curious is this dual nature of this hemispheric nature uh, is a recurring thing in our in our brains and it is then eventually manifest in the macro organism itself. And so obviously we can see with a political divide that we have this sort of left right dichotomy. So this hemispheric gradient as it were recurs in our systems and if you if we analyze it at the point of individual then we see it in the brain which means we see it in the the microstructures and then as we scale out it also manifests itself in the macrostructure and this is somewhat understandable when we understand that we're adding up iterations of of a, f- a base processing approach this split brain processing. Now, the hemispheres are connected by this thing called the corpus callosum, which facilitates an interaction. If you sever that, there's interesting research uh, by Sperry, and I can't think of the other name right now, but I'll put it up. They studied what happens when you severed the corpus callosum and the, the, the interesting effects. Well, anyway, so finishing up this semester now, we get to this end chapter, chapter 14. And here Dr. Madden brings up ACT, uh, a type of therapy, ACT, acceptance and commitment therapy. Essentially, building off the thesis of behaviorism in a way is that thoughts or behaviors are not caused by thoughts. And that maybe seems like a rather bold assertion, but when you strip it down, the underlying premise is we don't actually have free will in the way that we sometimes conceptualize free will. But here he talks about Dr. Jill Bolte Taylor, who experienced a massive stroke on the left side of her brain. And this side involved an verbal behavior. And what she was left with was with a right hemisphere, which focuses on stimuli happening right now, not what has happened before and not what one imagines will happen in the future. So in other words, the effects, and she goes on to describe her. So I looked up her, her TED talk and listened to a very interesting um, talk. But so she lost access to her left hemisphere. And so she was processing reality through her her right hemisphere. And what happened was a dissolution of this sort of idea of time or this idea of things being separate. And this seems somewhat similar to many spiritual experiences or people who have taken mind-altering substances 
what they experience, a disintegration of the ego, as it were. Of course, one of the things we learn in ecology is that models aren't the be-all, end-all of reality, but they're more like entry points for discussing. There'll always be uh, a degree of oversimplification within models, and so it isn't that the brain is purely this compartmentalized thing, but I think that we do have a well-established uh, body of research that shows that there are special specialty functions allocated, generally allocated, and, and there's always variance. If there's no variance, then there's no evolution because there's no, nothing to select upon. But over time, that variance aggregates into generalized trends, and that was part of the research that we had done this semester in, in ecology. But the way that I had conceptualized this in f terms of consciousness research is, is if we look at the brain primarily as a as a pattern recognition processor, recognition and replication of patterns, and this is, comes up in speech, and Skinner's approach to speech, I think, is really quite interesting, which, again, is, is um, approached in this final chapter. But this uh, idea that we, we recognize patterns in our environment and from I mean, if you add everything to our environment, that would include other members of our species, but we recognize patterns, our brain's able to recognize them, and then we're able to replicate them. Well, a few fundamental things about that. We cannot recognize patterns that we aren't in some capacity capable of replicating. And language is a, it's a pattern replication acquisition. It's an exchange. So every, every human exchange is a pattern exchange. Conceptualizing that with the brain is that we can distill or understand that there are maybe two categories or classes, pattern types, if you will. And one is what we might describe as a distinct or discrete pattern recognition, and that would be like letters on a page. And one would be a fluid or a dynamic pattern processing, and that might be a sequence of dance moves. And so one is more physically, it's more physiologically rooted into the experience. And so what I hypothesize is that the right brain excels more in this fluid dynamic pattern processing. So it is more body connected. It would be good in doing a dance. And the left would be more recognizing discrete patterns. And that might be like code breaking. And so someone who might be dyslexic, for example, might excel in fluid pattern processing. And then, in fact, they're so good at it, it's hard for their brain to hone in on discrete pattern processing the way that you would um, in reading words off of a page. But these are, when well integrated, these are complementary forces that are necessary in order to produce not only consciousness, but the evolution of the species and the themes that occur, the survival themes of balancing the need to integrate and preserve, that is a fundamental uh, theme of survival, as it were. It, it, so when it comes to the political divide, we see a debate on how much should we integrate from other cultures and how much should we preserve or differentiate. That's an ongoing negotiation. And from a meta frame, we might say that we want equality to such a point where everyone is equal. And at that point, we then want to conserve the society. And so progressive up into a point when it no longer is necessary and then become a conservative to conserve what you have created. Because if, if all you did was take a progressive standpoint, then you might progress yourself out of the structure that you just created or that you're trying to create. And so th it's this complex nature of navigation that we need both of these processing streams available to us in order to navigate a very complex world. And we had to do that to overcome all the survival challenges that were built into the planet. And from that, it, we have a substrate from which consciousness evolve because it solved adaptive functions. That is a framework to look at it. It is not, again, the uh, definitive answer, but it is a framework to analyze. 
And so this is very interesting. I was unfamiliar with her work, but based on what sort of I had hypothetically mapped up and mapped out in thinking about the way that consciousness is selected for, it to me makes sense that this is in alignment with um, such a framework, which is meta in the sense that we are looking at the brain and trying to understand the structure of the brain, which is a left brain, but we're also trying to understand how that explains this gradient that connects all of evolutionary history, which is very right-brained. And that's what this idea of integrative cognition is. And that's why it is in, it's sort of inseparably linked to meta-thinking or meta-frame cognition. And so why this is such a robust area of psychological research is its applicability um, let's say, for example, if we're studying the installation or installation of a growth mindset in early educational s- situations, um, we know that growth mindset produces more content engagement. We know that there is not necessarily a difference in aptitude, let's say, in males and females, and often in in their cognitive abilities, but we then see a divergence of how industries end up being represented. And one argument, of course, is that that is just a natural reflection of interest differences, but it doesn't tell us where the interests come from and, and the degree to which it's socially um, installed, as it were, or biologically installed. Now, from a meta frame, from a meta frame, We look at this from the question of let's play by evolutionary selection rules and whether it's socially installed, whether it's biologically installed, the system that produces interest had to evolve. What were the conditions that selected for that installation system? And that is sort of the way that integrates with ecological considerations. That informed a lot of the research that we did in our group project in our ecology course, and here you see us presenting on on that. And here we looked at the natural selection of empathy in Homo sapiens. We needed to focus on a species for the project, and so we said, well, why not do it on on people? And in this research project, looked at that, and that was informed um, by a lot of the research that I did this semester under the direction or supervision, you could say, of Dr. Freeman in looking at theory of mind, the literature on theory of mind, um, and what we know or what has been revealed or not revealed. And that represents a fair bit of literature search. And I here on the website to show it as only about half of what I actually went through and, and you know read through the articles and then tried to extract out a picture. And that's sort of the pr- preliminary stages of any sort of meta-analysis or a scoping um, review. So this is somewhat of a hastily put together overview, but I think I'm going to put this as something to access on this very site that we see so that a, a program who is perhaps analyzing the research that I've done or wants to get a sense of um, me as a student or hear how I would approach a subject, it it may be helpful in forming whether or not they would be interested in taking on a student such as myself. Our light carries on endlessly, even after death. The shortness of prayer. A great change of our psychological attitude is imminent. That is certain. And why? Because we need more. We need more psychology. We need more understanding of human nature because the only real danger that exists 
is man himself. They, they form a balance on, uh, on change versus stability. Then I think the way is open to step outside the moral matrix. This is the great insight that all the Asian religions have, have attained. Think about yin and yang. Yin and yang aren't enemies. Yin and yang don't hate each other. Yin and yang are both necessary, like night and day, for the functioning of the world. We are energy beings connected to one another through the consciousness of our right hemispheres as one human family. And right here, right now, we are brothers and sisters on this planet, here to make the world a better place. And in this moment, we are perfect, we are whole, and we are beautiful. All those things are possible, and when they come together, that creates a very powerful climate for change, for, for growth, for drawing out the potential of the, of the client. Hemisphere, our left hemisphere is a very different place. Our left hemisphere thinks linearly and methodically. Our left hemisphere is all about the past and it's all about the future. Our left hemisphere is designed to take that enormous.